Um, reminder that there's a project milestone that's due today. Um, two more submissions. The usual rules, we posted a clarification on Canvas about what kinds of things count as submission. Hope that was useful. Um, are there any questions about um, the, the, the project look mechanics? Yes. Yes. So what you will do at the very end is uh, at the end of the semester, you'll submit a report and you will also identify, I believe also on casual, you can do that. Um, or if not, based on the report, you'll identify six submissions as your official ones. So I'll assume that you choose the six ones that are uh, your best. Right. But are you going to be grading all six of them? Oh, no, no. Also, so uh, it's not, not so much grading the, uh, not so much grading the accuracy. Uh, I have a question on, uh, uh, on Zoom that I'll get to in a minute. It's not so much grading the accuracy as um, you, your models should, um, let's see, the goal of the project really is for you to have explored these ideas on your own with uh, with less supervision than say your homework. That means that you get the freedom to try out a whole bunch of things. Now, it is entirely possible that, uh, let's say you choose six algorithms. It just so happens that those six algorithms are fantastic. Those are the right ones to use. You choose the right data set, the feature set, and you, you do some, you do all the right things. And you get, your six algorithms are all better than the six uh, submissions of someone else who made the wrong, not the wrong, but less than optimal choices with their algorithms. But for each algorithm, they did the right thing. Let's say they did cross-validation for hyperparameters. They did not train on the validation set because then you know, you're know you just, uh, what's the point? They did all the right sort of experimental uh, process that you do in your homeworks, for instance. In that case, I'm not gonna penalize that person just because you got better accuracy. For each algorithm, uh, there are, you know, it may seem like you have a lot of choices, but it turns out not too many. For each algorithm, we'll look at uh, what's the a reasonable range of accuracies that you should get for that. If you get something much more than that or much less than that, then there's a problem. That's one. The second thing is, remember for your project, you submit the uh, results on uh, on a bunch of examples, right? You, you submit the labels for a bunch of uh, examples, the test set. The leaderboard shows you an accuracy only for half of them. That's the public leaderboard. There's also a private leaderboard that only I and the TS can access. So let's say your public leaderboard accuracy is 99% and your private leaderboard accuracy is 50%. Something's off, right? Uh, and that will raise an eyebrow and I'll have to look close at your code, uh, closely at your code, at your report to see if, are you doing something fishy? Uh, there are interesting fishy things that can be done. If those of you who attended the uh, talk on Friday would have gotten a hint of one interesting fishy thing that could be done by doing boosting on a leaderboard, which is really cool. Um, yeah, you can do that and it'll actually ruin your chances on the private leaderboard. So anyway, uh, so it's not just accuracy. It's not just being at the top of the leaderboard. If you're interested in knowing about uh, how you can do, uh, how you can use the leaderboard to make your accuracies look better, what you do is you keep submitting and you get, uh, you use the accuracy as quote unquote, the loss or one minus the accuracy as a loss and optimize on that. Um, and in fact, you can also do something very, very fancy with this. You can even choose which examples that you, uh, which test examples you use to uh, label and that way you could do set up an active learning game there. Um, it turns out that uh, there was a team that did that for a very high profile competition, a very high profile team that shall not be named, did that for a very high profile competition um, and uh, they got caught and it led to some people being fired and public embarrassment all around. Um, Anyway, that's a, a orthogonal story. I think I answered your question somewhere there, right? Uh, just got kind of sidetracked. But there's a question on Zoom that I want to address. Will we have a homework where we will write code for Adaboost? Uh, no, we will not. 
if you would like to write code for Adaboost and want to talk about it, feel free to come chat about that with us. Uh, uh, I'm not going to do Adaboost homework mostly because I really want you to do a SVM logistic regression homework. Um, in fact, the next homework, which if everything goes well, will be released tonight, otherwise sometime tomorrow, uh, involves you implementing SVM, involves you deriving the loss function and gradient descent for logistic regression and implementing it and implementing whatever you derive uh, on uh, one or more data sets that we provide. Uh, I could have added Adaboost to the mix, but uh, uh, this is heavy enough and we are coming close to the end of the semester and I don't want to pile more on than necessary. Other questions? If there are no questions, we're going to go into right back into where we left things off. We were talking about Bayesian learning in the previous lecture, and we're going to continue that uh, topic today. Um, just to remind you, uh, Bayesian learning involves defining the concept of what is the best classifier, the concept of best, using a Bayesian criterion. If we think of data sets and hypotheses as random variables, I could say, I, I, I want the hypothesis that maximizes the probability of the hypothesis given the data set. And the way to read that is the hypothesis is a random variable. Among all the hypotheses that exist in your hypothesis class, what's the probability that this one is the true one? That's the meaning of the random variables. And the data sets are random variables. Of all data sets of this size that could exist, or of all data sets of all sizes that could exist, what's the probability that you ended up with this one? So the um, the goal of Bayesian learning is to define, characterize this probability, P of H given D. Am I louder when I stand here? Okay. Um, is to characterize this probability and uh, use this in interesting ways. You could do many different things with this. One of those is you can just ask, what's the most probable hypothesis given the data set? That gives us this criterion called the maximum a posteriori. This is the posterior probability of the hypothesis given the data. Maximum a posteriori criterion says, pick the hypothesis that's most probable given the data. That seems reasonable. You could do other things. You could do things like, rather than choosing the uh, uh, hypothesis that maximizes this probability, you could sample from this distribution, or you could collect a whole bunch of them and do something more interesting at prediction time. But for now, we'll keep it simple, as simple as uh, such as it is. So we'll focus on this maximum a posteriori estimation. But the, the, the cool thing here is uh, that because the data set and the hypothesis are both random variables, I can apply Bayes rule. And this tells me that the posterior probability of the hypothesis given the data is, I'm going to write this in a slightly different way, is exactly the same as the likelihood of the data given the hypothesis times the prior probability of the hypothesis divided by probability of the data. So this quantity here is the prior. The prior probability of the hypothesis simply says what's the probability that this hypothesis is the right one before we see encounter before we encounter any data. Um, the middle term on top is called the likelihood. And the likelihood is asking what's the likelihood that this particular hypothesis generated uh, a data set. And the important thing here is that the posterior probability is proportional to the product of the likelihood and the price. And rather than directly, uh, rather than directly characterizing the posterior probability over the hypothesis, the maximum of posteriori criterion typically says we're going to We'll see examples of how this is done. We're going to characterize the likelihood and the prior, and then set up an optimization problem so that we maximize the product. That takes care of maximum a posteriori map hypothesis, map uh, uh, learning. There's also the maximum likelihood estimation. Maximum likelihood estimation is a simplification of the map criterion. 
it says, yeah, I'd like to do map, but I have no idea which hypothesis is the right one before I see any data. I have no preference over hypotheses uh, devoid of data. So I'm going to let the data do all the heavy lifting. What does it mean to say that I have no preference over a certain uh, outcome? It means that across all the outcomes that that, hypothesis, that random variable can take, you have a uniform distribution. You, you, are, you are maximally uncertain. So P of H is a uniform distribution, which means it, it doesn't depend on H. As a result, the, when we apply the, when we, when we treat the prior distribution as uniform, we are left with simply maximizing the likelihood term. So the maximum likelihood estimation is a special case of map estimation where the prior probability is the uniform distribution. This is where we stop. Um, today, I'm going to pick up here with two examples and then if time permits, we'll talk a bit about uh, discriminative and generative learning. Any questions so far? Everyone's on board? Okay, I see two heads nodding. So I'm going to assume you, you're representing the entire class. It's a heavy burden. All right, so let's talk about, uh, let, let's kind of instantiate these ideas with, uh, with some simple examples. The first one is going to be a very, very simple example, an example so simple that you might actually kind of uh, get a little bored uh, or you might know the answer before, before we do anything. Uh, this involves instantiating maximum likelihood estimation criteria. Uh, just to remind you, HML, I'm going to use that notation for max, the maximum likelihood hypothesis, is the hypothesis that maximizes this quantity here, the likelihood. So given a new problem, given a new data set, a new task, whatever, uh, to set up this optimization problem, you need to define two things. You, 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 to set up this optimization, there are only two things in this optimization problem. One of them is this quantity here, capital H. Capital H is the hypothesis. You need to say which set of functions your uh, optimizer is going to search over. And the other question, thing that you need to define is this probability probability of the data given the hypothesis, like the likelihood term. In other words, you need to somehow come up with an, uh, a model, uh, and here I'm using the model in a slightly different sense. Um, you need to come up with a mathematical expression that says, here is how I believe the data was generated using this particular hypothesis. If you are able to set those things, two things up, then you are ready to write down this optimization problem. They're not talking about solving the optimization problem yet. They're only talking about declaratively specifying the optimization problem. If we are lucky, we can kind of massage that mathematical expression and bring it to a form that we can give to one of our existing solvers. You know, for example, stochastic gradient descent. Or if you are very, very lucky, as we will be shortly, you can actually take derivatives and solve the problem on paper. So there's no need for an algorithm. You can just analytically solve the problem. So let's uh, look at some examples. So the first one involves uh, learning, uh, setting up a model where the, uh, the, uh, you, the thing that you're learning is the probability that defines a Bernoulli random variable. So let's say that, uh, what's the story today? Yeah, so we, uh, you, you got a consulting job based on uh, your machine learning ex expertise. And this company makes light bulbs, and um, as with any sort of manufacturing thing, a bunch of them are faulty. You need to kind of help them figure out uh, what's the probability that those light bulbs are faulty. And of course, you've taken machine learning, you know everything about statistics, and you need to first ask, are they all IID? Are they all identically distributed? Are, otherwise, it, you can't do uh, one. And let's say that they are. At that point, you're ready, you need to do some experiments, uh, or at least you need some data, but uh, let's say that you do some experiments because it involves breaking light bulbs. So, or at least trying out light bulbs. Let's say you try out 100 light bulbs. 80 of those work and 20 of those don't. And you declare that the probability of failure is 20%. That seems reasonable, right? Seems fairly obvious. So it is 
20 divided by 100, that's the probability of failure. But then you are asked for a proof. Why is it 20%? Can someone take a guess? Other than just telling me that 20% because it's 20 divided by 100. Can someone take a guess using any of the ideas that we've encountered so far? Yes. If we assume that there are high identity Yes. Then any subset of the multiplied multiple is going to be just as likely to have all the identity subsets that are going to be multiple. That's right. So if we observe that there are only that don't work, if we extrapolate this applies to the rest of the set. How did you, you know, know there's a little bit of uh, extrapolation happening in what you described. Yeah. So how do you go from, this is something that, uh, it, it's obvious, right? We do this, uh, you know, this is pretty much where, how we uh, sometimes probability start. Uh, like, you know, you conduct an experiment, uh, you toss a coin, and uh, if you get 50 heads out of 100, then the probability of uh, the coin toss being heads is 6.5. Yes. Uh, you could say that because we don't have any previous sort of table, it's basically, Okay, so why is why is it 20 divided by 100? Why is it not 21 divided by 102? Or something else? I see a hand there. Yes, last one. I don't hear a very concrete answer using the words maximum and likelihood because that's the goal of this whole exercise. Uh, you've answered a lot. I haven't heard your voice today. Okay. And it's possible that the actual one is a lot more about the but it's lower Okay, that's that's exactly the answer that I'm looking for, and I'm gonna walk through this process. Let's kind of uh, instantiate this, uh, um, you know, in, in a bit of detail. Let's say that the probability of failure is P, some P, and this is what we are looking to find. P here is the quote unquote model that we are trying to learn. The hypothesis space for this model is any number between 0 to 1, because it's a single, it's a, it's a, uh, it's the probability that defines the failure for a Bernoulli random variance. And each trial is IID. So let's say we have uh, 80 works and 20 don't. I can ask, among all data sets that could exist, among all sets of 100 observations that could exist in the universe, what's the probability that I would observe this exact one, provided that my current, my hypothesis is that uh, the model, that the probability of failure is P. Then what's the probability that if I uh, randomly pick 100 light bulbs, 80 of them work and 20 don't, if the probability of failure is P. Well, it's exactly the same as when one light bulb fails, it's P, the probability is P. When 20 of them fail, they're all independent from each other, it's P power 20. Right? Times when one light bulb uh, succeeds, I don't know what it means to succeed, I get works. Uh, the probability is one minus P, the probability that 80 of them work, they're all independent of each other, which itself, by the way, is a very shady assumption. They're all light bulbs from the same factory. They're probably not independent of each other, but we're not going to ask that question today. So the probability of that 80 of them work is one minus P power 80. Now, this is not it. We are given 100. There could be any 20 of them that don't work. 
but we are talking about a particular set of 20 that don't work. So it is, we still, we have to multiply by 100 choose 20. This is the probability of the data given the hypothesis. This is the, the or in other words, this is the likelihood of observing this particular data set of uh, 20 light bulbs that don't work and the 80 that do. Questions about this, what I have described here? Yes. The hypothesis is simply P. It's it's the probability. The hypothesis is a function, but in this case, it's a function that's completely parameterized by a single number, the probability. Questions? So you've seen 80, a data set with 80 light bulbs that work and 20 that don't. And uh, of course, I have messed up the 80 and 20 here. This should have been 20. Oh, you know what? This error is going to carry through. So let me fix it in a different way. So let's say the probability that the light bulb works is P. So we have P power 80 because 80 of them work, 1 minus P power 20, and we could have chosen any 80 of them that uh, work, but so it's, but uh, what's the probability that uh, some 80 of those work? Okay. Now, given this quantity, the, what's the, we can apply the maximum likelihood criteria. The maximum likelihood criteria simply says, among all these uh, values of P, among all the hypotheses that exist, the one that I think is the best is the one that maximizes the likelihood. It's an it's a choice. Choice, you know, this is the when I say choice, it's a choice uh, in how we decide to um, uh, pick the value of P. This is a particular uh, uh, criterion for deciding what is best, namely the one that maximizes the value of P. So I could ask the the probability of success is r max of p of the probability of the data given the value of p which is simply r max um, notice that this term really doesn't matter because it's uh, a constant so we're going to get rid of it p power 80 times 1 minus p power 20 or p in 0 to 1 So we can, if we can solve this optimization problem, we would have obtained the maximum likelihood estimate. So that's the goal. And we can solve this optimization problem analytically, but it turns out, can someone guess what the value of P that maximizes this expression is? It's 0.8. It turns out it's 0.8. You can, I, uh, maybe I have actually uh, written this, but the way we prove it is we actually kind of, uh, solve this argmax problem, argmax over the day of uh, of this expression here. So, what is the learning algorithm here? So, these, I can ask what's the learning algorithm that set up an optimization problem. But I could ask, I mean, first of all, is this even learning? Let's uh, let's not worry about that yet. Uh, but we can ask, what's the learning algorithm? I need to find the argmax over uh, of this expression here. Uh, but it, uh, in most cases, when we apply uh, likelihood, uh, maximum likelihood or uh, maximum uh, a posteriori, rather than working with the likelihood themselves, it's invariably going to be easier if you take the log of the function. Because log is an increasing function, it does not change the relative ordering of the uh, of the uh, the arguments, so it's fine. So rather than maximizing the likelihood, we're going to maximize the log likelihood. In fact, uh, that is so common that uh, you might even see log likelihood written with two L's uh, in some papers. We just want to maximize the log likelihood. 
And if you have uh, A that don't work and B that work, oh, look, again, I switched the A and B once again. Um, this slide is internally consistent. It's not consistent with what came before. Earlier, I had uh, P being the probability of success, but now we're back to P being probability of failure. Uh, I'll fix this up uh, offline before I upload it. So the, pro the, the uh, likelihood of the log likelihood of the data is I'm going to write this here is the log of a, a plus B choose A times the probability of the failure. In this case, P is the probability of failure. Power A times one minus P powers B. In this case, in the example that we saw, B was uh, 80 and A was 100. This expression here, let's move this to the side and make it a little smaller. This expression is exactly the same. Uh, the first thing to note is this term is irrelevant because the only variable in this optimization problem is P. And A and B don't depend on P. They are just constant, so we can ignore those. And then I have log of P power A times uh, 1 minus P power B, which is exactly the same as, uh, I shouldn't put an equals here, but I can write A times log P plus B times log 1 minus P. And I need to maximize this function with respect to P. If I can solve this, optimization problem, then I'll have the value of P that maximizes that original function. So far, so good. Any questions? So far, so good was a question from me. It was not a so far, so good, full stop. Yes. So, um, when you started using log, like this, so the reason I use log is because it makes the next step easy, namely when we take derivatives. Uh, it's going to make the optimization much more, uh, much less hairy. That's the reason we use log here. It's a, it's almost like a, a neat trick that we can use so that. We don't end up with crazy uh, expressions when we take the gradients here, when we take the derivatives. In fact, let's take the derivatives. So the expression that we had, we needed to maximize over P, P, A log P plus B log one minus P. Let's, I, I can take, the derivative of this whole thing with respect to, I'm going to call that some f of p. I can take the derivative of f with respect to p. So I can, this is, p is a single number. Remember that. Yeah? So I don't have partial derivatives of any. So it's just a single number. So I can write df over dp is, well, I just take, I, I use the standard rules of calculus. A divided by p plus b times right this should not come as a shock to anyone i hope this is like you know third grade stuff um and uh, at this point you set this to zero uh, you you want to find the maximum of this function so i set this to zero so a divided by p is equal to b divided by one minus p and you can solve this however you want i can say a times one minus p is p a minus. I move the ap on the other side. That means p So this is why it was okay for me to say that the probability of failure is count the number of failures, which is a divide by the number of failures plus number of successes, A plus B. The simple thing that we think of as, you know, uh, uh, here is the reason, uh, here is uh, uh, why it was okay to define the probability as uh, 
0.2 probability of failure because 20 failures divided by 100 experiments. Well, it was not, it was, a, it was intuitive, but that intuition actually is an intuitive uh, 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 um, justification of maximum likelihood estimation. So let me recap this process. So if you set the goal, the original goal was to find the probability of this, uh, of a light bulb failing, given that you see that 100 light bulbs were tested and 20 of them failed. And hopefully most of you agreed without actually going through this process that the probability of failure seems like it's a reasonable thing to say it is 0.2. Instead of just you know, simply doing that, what you could do, what you could have done is set up a maximum likelihood model. And the way you do that is you need to define two things, the hypothesis space and a model for how the data was generated. The hypothesis space here is simply a single number. Every light bulb fails with probability P. P is a number between zero and one. That's the hypothesis. Then we need to set up a model that generates the data. The model is that each light bulb is independent from all other light bulbs. As a result, I can write down the, the likelihood of, the, of observing this data as something like this, as exactly that expression there. And then you take the log likelihood, take the derivative of that with respect to the one, one parameter that we have, namely p, set it to zero, and you get the probability of uh, failure is a divided by a plus p, which matches the intuition that we have. In fact, if this process had given anything but this, you should have been suspicious. Questions? And in this process, we have assumed uh, a simple uh, Bernoulli model. You could have assumed a different model. Had you assumed a different model that generates the data, you a uh, different probabilistic, had you made a different probabilistic assumption, you might have come up with a completely different answer. You could have, uh, instead of every uh, light bulb failing independently of all other light bulbs, you could have assumed that the probability that the light bulb fails is some function of some properties of that light bulb, some measurement of the light bulb. Then you set up a different optimization problem and you'll have to solve that. In all of these probabilistic models, you need to come up with an explanation for how the parameters can be used to generate the data, so define the likelihood like we did here, and then if you're doing maximum likelihood, you opt optimize the likelihood expression or more likely, more often, the log likelihood uh, to get the parameter. This is a very, very simple example. In fact, this is, an ex this is a clear case of uh, how I've used math to make something that is obvious, complicated. Um, but I did this deliberately so that, you know, the, the, you must have had an intuitive answer when we started this. And hopefully this explanation matches your intuition. Yes. So we need to like consider like how many, like we, we put a hundred arbitrary, uh -huh. we could have chosen 50 and, and gotten zero wrong. But this, this, our probability would still be all of the work. In this case, it, yes. with the max, maximum likelihood assumption, that's, that's what you'll end up with. And uh, there are ways to get around. One way to do that is to say that, uh, you know, I believe that I'm going to believe the data. But I also believe that the probability is not going to be zero or one. And you introduce what's called a prior. When you say that I don't believe that the probability should not be zero or one, you've automatically introduced a prior. Yes. And that takes you to maximum a posteriori estimation. You need to introduce the right set of priors for this. Uh, you could do this with, uh, the, what, for instance, for Bernoulli, a prior could be the beta distribution. If you go through the same exercise and you know uh, do, derive this intro uh, p of d given h, you might also have p of h here. Uh, if you go through that, that what you might end up with is the probability of best is a plus some epsilon divided by a plus b plus two epsilon. 
So you, if, if you do 50 experiments and you find that none of them fail, you still have a small probability epsilon, uh, epsilon divided by whatever of uh, the failure. You know that it's an unlikely event, but it's not impossible. Other questions? We won't be talking about the beta priors and all that, but uh, hopefully I've given you enough keywords to search for. Yes. So the question was in more complicated uh, problems, are we still going to do the same thing? Uh, define the uh, define whatever we want in terms of some parameters and find the parameter. Basically, yes. Uh, we define a model using some parameters, then we need to describe how the likelihood expression is constructed, construct the likelihood estimation, optimize it, and get up. Let's look at a comp more complicated example, which involves not the Bernoulli distribution, but the normal distribution. Once again, for maximum likelihood estimation, you need to define the hypothesis space. Uh, that your model is searching, that your learner is searching over, and you need to describe, define how your data is generated given that the hypothesis is some particular symbolic value. In the coin, in the light bulb case, the, the hypothesis was some symbol p. It was not a number. It was a symbol, and we described the likelihood, likelihood expression in terms of that symbol. We need to do that in general. What we'll do now is consider uh, uh, the, uh, the case of regression. Suppose your hypothesis consists of real valued functions. Your input, let's say your task is uh, something like uh, uh, mapping a vector to real number. So your input is a vector of features. We'll call that uh, x. x is a d dimensional vector of features. And the output is some real number, y, which can be any uh, value uh, between minus infinity to infinity. And uh, we've considered uh, regression before. In particular, we looked at linear regression before. Let's see the Bayesian perspective on how we might come across, the, uh, come, you know, address this problem. What we saw before was the loss minimization perspective. We defined the square loss, set up an optimization problem, and uh, uh, wrote down the, uh, the thing for linear regression. Let's look at the Bayesian point view. For that, we need to talk about how we believe the data is generated. Suppose each example xi is uh, drawn randomly, maybe at uniform from the d dimensional space. It doesn't really matter because it's going to get uh, canceled out. Then there's a true function, f. f is applied to that uh, example to get the label f of xi. The true function labels the examples, but we who get to observe the data don't get to see the real label. Because before we encounter the real label, the true label is perturbed by some noise. We'll call the noise EI. EI is the noise that's added to the label for example XI. This noise is drawn according to, and here, everything I'm saying is my assumption about the data. I'm assuming, uh, so every bullet point here uh, should be prefixed with, let us assume that. So let us assume that this noise, the i, is drawn um, from the Gaussian distribution with zero mean and some fixed standard distribution, uh, standard deviation. Okay. What I have described here is a generative process, a, the story of the data, if you will. This is how the data was generated, I'm assuming. So if you or if you like symbols rather than words, I could say the label yi for each example is simply f of xi plus ei, where ei is drawn from the normal distribution centered at zero. And let's say that this process was done repeated m times. Each time you pick a random xi, apply the function, draw some random noise, add to the uh, label, and then you create a pair x, y. 
and we have uh, m such pairs xi, yi. Questions about this process that generated the data? This is an assumption. I mean, there's no reason that the real world behaves this way. It's an assumption, and as we'll see, the assumption proves to be convenient. Yes. Is there, is there, is there, is there, is that e? No, no, that e is not e. Uh, I know what you mean. It's not uh, the same e that is uh, that shows up with logarithm. No, it it could have been written epsilon. <laughs> The true label is f of x, but the true label is always corrupted before we observe it. So the best we can do is try to fit the y. Yeah. Because the true function is f. And our goal is to recover f. Did you have a question? No, we don't have control. This is how nature provides data to us. If we're not, we, in a perfect world, we would like to get rid of this error, but we don't have the choice. There's measurement error. There is uh, error in all the errors that could happen between when the function is invented and when you encounter this one example, it gets uh, uh, accumulated into this one e i for each example. This is uh, this is an assumption. This is an assumption, and this is. Um, have you heard that quote? All models are wrong. Some models are useful. This is just a convenient um, story that we tell ourselves because it turns out this proves to be useful. Other questions? Questions from people who have not asked questions? Question from Zoom? Okay, let's see what we can do with this. Now, suppose we have a hypothesis n. n is a function that behaves very much like f, in that it takes a vector in d dimensions, xi, and produces a number. So we can get h of x. Uh, for any example. So we could ask what's the error of this example y minus h of x. Now suppose h was the true function. Even if h was the true function, this quantity will not be zero. Why? Because we added that noise. So even if the true, even if we had the true function at hand, this process, this expression would not be zero. And uh, in fact, if h was the true function, this expression yi minus h of xi would come from a normal distribution because ei is drawn from the normal distribution centered at zero and maybe there's some standard deviation, some unknown standard deviation, but it doesn't really matter. So because each error is drawn from the normal distribution, even if the function h was the true function, this what well, the gap between yi and h of xi would still not necessarily be zero. It would be this random variable ei. Questions before we move on. This is a uh, an important point to make uh, to kind of internalize. Yeah. Where is the where is the ei? The ei the error is. This is the ei. Yes. We so have the error as the difference between yi and our hypothesis, the number of functions our hypothesis produced. Yeah. Is the ei is. So ei, the, where ei comes in is as follows. Even if h was the true function, suppose h was the true function, then this gap, this error would be exactly ei because we know that yi is f of x i plus ei. Even if h was equal to f, the difference y minus h will not be zero because our data is not drawn perfectly from that function h. And in particular, that difference is actually sampled. It, it turns out it, it behaves as if these were samples from a random variable from this distribution because ei is drawn from that distribution. So what we 
why don't we just add a PI in our calculation for the error? Ah, okay. What are we going to do with it? What we will do is exactly uh, what's coming up next. The error is a Gaussian distribution. The error is Gaussian with zero mean and some fixed standard deviation. So we can ask, what's the probability of, so we can, let me write it in words rather than, what's the probability of observing this pair xi comma yi if, or given that, the true function is h. I, so I could ask this question, what's the probability of observing this pair xi comma yi if the true function is uh, some function h? That's exactly the same as the probability of, well, let me kind of expand on this. This is the same as the probability of xi given that, I'm, I'm just writing this shortcut, uh, given that the true function is h times the probability of yi given xi comma h. Now, I'm assuming that this quantity doesn't depend on h. We are choosing examples randomly, independent of the true function. So we are not going to worry about that at all. This expression, what's the probability of seeing the label yi for an example h, xi if the true function was h, is the exact same question I'm asking. Um, what's the probability that the error is yi minus h of xi Given, well, we, there's no nothing given. I mean, uh, what's the probability that the error is yi minus h of xi? Assuming, of course, that the error is drawn from the normal distribution. That's where the error comes in. Right? So that, that error is probably a hidden error because the state maps perfectly. Perfectly, you still have. Exactly. Exactly. That's right. Even if h was the true function, and we are assuming that h is the true function here, even if h was the true function, we are left with an error that is a sample from a normal distribution. I've just highlighted things all the way around. I hope the narrative kind of guided you through what I highlighted. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Ah, uh, yes, I know. Yeah, so we are talking about probability densities and pretending that they are probability mass. Sorry, the, uh, yeah, so I'm kind of going to ignore that. Uh, there's a technical detail that makes it work. The probability that it's exactly that value is basically a measure zero. Uh, of course, it's not going to happen. So we are going to talk about around that. We'll kind of mess with that a little bit. Yeah, I'm basically hand-waving curiously here because I don't want to get into that detail. Or the detail that I don't want to get into is the question of why is this probability equal to this expression here? What have I written? This expression here in the box is simply the probability uh, density for a normal distribution centered at zero. The probability so probability of this random variable I'm calling it z is one over sigma root two pi e power right um, and in this case the z is y i minus h of x i and what you said is absolutely right but there's a technical detail that makes it work we can you can kind of uh, explore that offline. So the, this expression here goes into this. This is the probability of, uh, for a normal distribution with zero mean and uh, uh, standard deviation sigma. 
That's what I've written inside the box here. The probability of yi given h being the true label and the example being xi is exactly the thing inside the box. Now we have m such samples. With m such samples, we have m independent samples. The probability of observing one data point, if it was observed, if it was generated from the true distribution, the if it was generated using the function h, is this expression here. We have m examples. So importantly, all those m examples were generated independently from each other. So the probability of seeing all of them is just a product of this probability here. That expression, the probability of seeing this particular data set is nothing but the likelihood. So the likelihood of the data is simply the product of a whole bunch of these. Uh, oh, I do the arrow wrong. Is this expression here? The likelihood of the data is simply the uh, is proportional to the product of a whole bunch of these expressions uh, that we've written here, and this is what we would like to maximize. Our goal is to find the most likely hypothesis. We are in the world of maximum likelihood estimation. Our goal is to find the the so what we just did is to write down the likelihood function. Our goal is to find out the most likely uh, hypothesis. So we want to solve our max of the data uh, of the probability of the data given the hypothesis, which is simply the R max of the product over all the examples of the probability of each example, uh, given that the hypothesis is H. But we just wrote down that this can be written in terms of uh, this normal distribution over the error terms. Before I move on, any questions? What's left after this is simply just optimization stuff. So far, what we did was to build up the story so that now we can give it to an optimizer and in a perfect world, it will solve everything for us. Yes. So I have often so with big, uh, big formula. The sigma for that thing, that, what was that from? This one? Uh, no, yes. That part, yeah. That's the probability for a normal distribution. The pro this is a normal distribution centered at with mean zero and standard deviation sigma. I could have written this as n of uh, y minus h. The mean is zero because there is nothing, there's no, uh, it's usually y minus the, the, the variable minus the mean. There's no mean. So the expression on top is, is the probability that the, the label yi was observed for this particular example. We are observing m such labeled examples. So the expression at the bottom is simply the using that to construct the likelihood of the entire data. Questions before we talk about solving this optimization problem? Well, what do you do next? What's the what what's the next thing to do when you are trying to solve maximum likelihood? You set up an a like you'll set up a likelihood. What do you optimize actually? Yes. Okay, so that's one important point. You can this stuff. Um, this stuff doesn't depend on it, so you can toss it out. Is there something else you can do to get rid of the e power whole thing? Yeah. You take the log. So how do we maximize this expression? We first get, get rid of all the constants and take the log. And we work with log likelihood instead of likelihood. So the log of this expression, once we get rid of the constant, in fact, I think I kept the constants. Yeah, I did keep the constants. I can take the log of this expression. It's simply log of uh, sigma root, one over sigma root two pi minus the thing inside the power, inside the uh, e power 
this expression here, but including the minus impact. So the minus uh, shows up here. Okay, so I'm trying to maximize this expression. The first term is, of course, a constant. This term here does not depend on h. It is just adding up a whole bunch of constants. Changing the hypothesis is not going to change the value of that term. So I might as well get rid of it because it's just, you know, dead weight. So I could get rid of that. So I'm left with only the second term, which is this thing here. So let's just clean up these things and move the minus out. So I have R max sum. The, when you take the log, the product becomes a sum. So R max sum over all the examples of yi minus h of xi squared divided by 2 sigma squared. Well, we still have more constants. Changing the value of h does not change the value of sigma. Right? So that's also a constant. It's just something that gets multiplied every time. It does not really matter that we keep that hanging around. So we could toss that also out. So we could toss. So this goes out. And the other thing to note here is we want to maximize, in this case, minus some function of h. Oh, I should not say f. Maximize some expression, some expression, maximize some expression, negative of some expression. That's exactly the same as minimizing the expression itself and applying the negative afterwards. Right? So instead of solving argmax, I could have solved argmin. So I could have, doing those two things together, I uh, get this final expression here. I'm minimizing overall hypotheses, the sum over all the ex uh, examples of yi minus h of xi squared. This must look awfully familiar. So the most likely hypothesis is argmin, well, minimize the sum of the squared errors. This is exactly the least square, least mean square uh, uh, thing. In particular, if you assume that the hypotheses are linear functions, if h of x is simply w transpose x, what you get is argmin y minus w transpose x squared. So we started off with this really complicated story involving the noise that, you know, we have this example that the true function is applied to and some noise is added, the noise is Gaussian, they're all independent of each other, maximum likelihood and all that, and we come back to this thing. We come back to least mean square regression. This is, in fact, the probabilistic explanation for the least mean square regression problem. What we have derived is exactly the same thing we saw before. And by the way, I'm not going to solve this problem because we already solved it. We looked at how to solve this optimization problem in quite a bit of detail sometime earlier in the semester. So I'm not talking about it. Did you have a question? Did, does anyone have a question? So the, the one of the lessons to kind of take home from here is the Bayesian length does two things for us here. It kind of exposes the underlying assumptions that lead to this. The, when we are solving least mean square, we are implicitly working with that story that I'm sure some of you thought was like so made up. The examples are drawn uniformly at random and or at least ind independent of the hypothesis. And then the true function is applied and then a error is added, but that error is drawn from the random normal distribution with zero mean important. And I do all that and I get this uh, same thing. So if you apply this mean square regression, at some level, you are also kind of buying this generative story for the data. So there are two perspectives here for linear regression. I could come at it from the loss minimization point of view. The loss minimization perspective says, um, I don't really have any opinions about how the data was generated. I don't care. All I know is I can define this notion of an error. I can define I can define a penalty term for, for a regressor uh, for being too far off from the observed data. 
that penalty is simply the square error. And my goal, I don't care about how the data was generated, my goal is simply to minimize the total squared error or the mean squared error. And you get this, this uh, expression, this uh, uh, expression that's written on the screen. Or you could come at it from a Bayesian point of view. We believe that errors are normally distributed uh, with zero mean and fixed standard deviation. And you want to find a linear regressor using the maximum likelihood principle you come to the exact same expression. Whichever one of these makes you sleep better at night, believe that story. You are solving the same optimization problem. Any questions? Yes. Can we say that uh, we could model this with some other we might arrive at similar? No, that's a very good uh, expression. Uh, that's a very good comment. In the Bayesian point of view, I said the errors are normally distributed. So I could have chosen some other distribution, right? I could have believed that the errors are generated using some, are drawn from some other distribution. In that case, you work through the whole process, you will end up with a different objective. One example that you can work with offline is if you believe that the errors are, uh, the errors come not from the Gaussian distribution, but from the Laplace distribution, what you will see is the optima, the objective is the, the you want to minimize the absolute value of the difference of the error. This is the generative story for uh, uh, this minimization problem, which is different. So choosing the the distri error distribution will change the optimization problem. Of course, if you want to uh, uh, you know justify this using loss minimization. What you would say is, oh, no, no, it's not Laplace or anything. This is how I define the loss. This is how I define penalty for the classifier. And that whole rest of the story is just a story that makes you sleep better at night. So again, it's uh, it, whatever works for you. But you know, these two perspectives, I think, are two different ways to look at the same problem. And they, in my, in my mind, I think of them as, uh, and we'll see another uh, example, a few other examples of such thing. I think of these as, uh, you know, different mathematical formalisms that give you this, that agree on this point. Now, which one is the the right one is irrelevant. The more important question is which one is more productive, which one allows you to kind of directly apply it to some new thing. And which of these perspectives gives you the, the flexibility and the set of tools that you need to apply these ideas for something else? So for instance, with the Bayesian perspective, we did not talk about it here. You could have said that uh, uh, you could have added extra priors on the date, on the high, on the weights. And it would kind of easily fold into this whole thing. Um, um, you know, you, you can work it out offline. But from the loss minimization point of view, you can add a regularizer. Turns out this, the prior and the regularizer behave like each other. But there are other things. You could have changed the, you could have changed the, the distribution. You could have instead, in fact, even uh, changed the whole generative story rather than the error being added to the prediction of the hypothesis. Maybe the inputs are perturbed first before the function is applied. It naturally gives you a different optimization problem and you can kind of systematically explore those pairs of ideas. So both of these perspectives are important. I, I, I really don't care which one of them uh, is the right one, as long as they give you the technical tools to kind of innovate beyond what you see here. But why do you mean that uh, these perspectives are more to solve on the mathematical side? Not from the mathematical side, more from the modeling side, more from setting up the optimization problem. Solving is actually the easy part because that's where you bring in the standard sort of stochastic optimization, SGD and all that. That part is well understood. The clever part here in, across all of this is never the, well, not never, but is less the algorithmic aspect of how to optimize. And it's more the sort of creative aspect of how do I design loss functions and classifiers and models and such things for the problem that I have. Yes, it's more of a formulation. 
it lets you write down the question in different ways so that you can kind of explore in different ways. Okay, uh, I'm going to summarize this unit here. We talked about Bayesian learning. Uh, it's just another way to ask what's the best hypothesis for a data set. And we looked at two specific answers to the question. One of them was maximum a posteriori, which I should point out, we've not yet instantiated in an example, and we'll do that when we come to logistic regression. We looked at two examples of maximum likelihood estimation. Both the examples of maximum likelihood estimation, it turns out, gave you answers that you already knew. But that doesn't matter because the goal is not so much the answer, but the process that we took to get to it. Um, you should be able to, you know, the, the, you should kind of think about how you might apply maximum likelihood uh, estimation for new problems if you've not already encountered this before. Uh, we'll at least we'll see one more instance of both of these in action when we talk about logistic regression. But uh, uh, you know, think about what we kind of went through, and I encourage you, as I always say, don't learn math by watching somebody else do it. Uh, you need to actually work it out yourself, uh, and you know, work it out without actually seeing the answer to see if you can arrive at the exact same thing. Because that will kind of test your ability to generalize. That's the goal of the whole class, right? Uh, 